hope you all got some hummingbirds still sticking around. We've got, uh, still got some coming to our feeders, but there's fewer, I've noticed. And so there'll be a sad day when we don't see any hummingbirds coming to our feeders, but we'll look forward to the spring when we see them again. Uh, we've, we've been having lots of them coming in. I've got a nice uh, glass uh, with lots of colors that when the sun hits it, it's nice and colorful, which is a hummingbird feeder. And they often would come there and after they finished with that feeder, they'd come to another feeder on it, stuck on our window. And then they'd take off and they'd yap out to each other, chasing each other. Uh, they're really funny birds. And we've got a whole lot of uh, uh, these uh, red-winged blackbirds come back again. We had them at the beginning of the season. They disappeared, and now they've come back again in force. <laughs> so uh, we don't mind. They've got a good sound. And once they've finished their damage, in comes the cardinals and the other birds. They take their turns. <laughs> so we've been enjoying that. Well, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee again for this time to open up the Scriptures, Lord, that we've got inspired word that which has been preserved we want to preach it with authority lord as we rightly divide it in christ's name we pray amen okay cool well um there's you know we're singing some songs so there's power in the blood there's power in the blood um you know that that idea um comes up a lot in the scriptures and hebrews is big time um, and it's also in um, Colossians, like if you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, through his blood in modern, many modern versions is out through his blood out um, so if you wanted to mention about the sacrifice of Christ it's finished the finished work and the connection with the the atonement that you find mentioned in the Old Testament has been taken all the way through uh, from right from the beginning right from Genesis you can see it and developed in the law of Moses uh, then right here, Colossians 1.14, there's a direct connection to it, but it's missing. Uh, if you look, for example, in these omissions, the little pamphlet we've got, you'll find that listed in there as one which has been um, got that phrase removed. So we're talking about an issue, man. It's a big, big issue. And, um, you know, we were talking about last time how that the... The scriptures are readable, they are authoritative. Paul assumed it, whereby when you read, when you read, you may understand, you may understand. Well, people are not going to understand if they can't read the scriptures and believe that it's truly the scriptures. You say, this is unthinkable. No, I'm afraid, my friends, it's happening. The scriptures are under attack and many preachers now believe that the Word of God has not been preserved. Has not been preserved. Now, they may not want to say that directly, but by implication, that's what they believe. And I think it's a sad day, personally. I think the damage is going to be massive. It says, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in Bonds and the mystery of Christ is something that has been developing right through the scriptures. And if you believe that God hasn't preserved his word, then you're not going to see the development of the mystery of Christ and be able to compare and understand how great a knowledge it was given to Paul concerning the mystery if you can't correctly compare. And these things affect us. So we talked about this idea of godly. And um, you notice in here it says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. And then down uh, a little bit further, you've got in Psalm 12, um, Help, 
Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. The faithful fail. What a sad day, man, when that occurs. And at the heart of this, I believe, is this idea that people cease to believe that the scriptures are from God. They're of God. And we need to get a godly teaching about how God has preserved this. Uh, and you notice here, rather than godly edifying, so here's the word used as an adjective, godly edifying, but it's actually uh, the edification of God, of God, you see. Godly here, meaning it's from God. It's from God. And we want a doctrine which is from God concerning preservation. That's what we want to build up. Um, and so, so on here, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Eusebos, eusebos. Godly. It's with piety. Piety. And so we want a doctrine which is pious. That from God, it's something that we can depend on and God will be happy with. That's what we want. This is a book which uh, I've been reading. And it's a fantastic book. It's a very, very good book. Uh, Philip Kaiser and Wil Wilbur Pickering. Pickering wrote a number of books, The Identity of the New Testament Text, which is a great book looking at these issues of how God has preserved his word. And we're talking about this whole business of preservation of God's word. Without preservation, we're in trouble. You can talk all you want about the inspiration of the originals. Well, the originals can be, can be inspired, but if God hasn't preserved it, we've just got some message about how there once was a Bible that was dependable, and you could read it and understand it, but now we don't have it. Is that, is that true? Is that what we want to believe? Many people are believing this. And they're getting this doctrine and teaching from people who are learned. They're smart people. They've got all the credentials. And people today want to look informed. They want to look academic. They want to look like they are, uh, they've got all the scholars on their side. Right? They want to look smart. Well, what we need to do is we need to be right before God. We need to be righteous before God. And so we are looking at some of these ideas about the Scripture, and we want to see what is of God, what is godly. And notice that God is going to keep people accountable. It says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us as Israel and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. That we may do all the words. Why? Because God will keep them accountable if they don't. That in itself, it, um, it, it implies that the scripture will be preserved. Look at this at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show the self approved unto God. Workmen needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. It's there to be divided. It's there to be handled correctly. And so we must have this idea of preservation. And then coming on down here, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. From a child? Well, this is just during the time of the New Testament. The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Which are able to make the wise. Well, if it hasn't been preserved, if the scriptures have not been preserved, in what way are you going to be wise? You will have ideas which are not from God that come out of the ideas of man. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. These scriptures were extant during the time of Paul and Timothy. And it says, profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction and right. It means that it must have existed then, back then. And today too. Over here it says in um, Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How? How? How are we going to do it if God has not preserved His Word? Why, all we have got is the guesses of our scholars. It's got to be preserved. It must be preserved. And it says this in Ephesians 6, 8, Knowing that whosoever, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive the Lord, whether he be bond or free. God is going to hold us accountable. And the only way he can do that is if he's preserved his word. We've got to know his will. It must be preserved. Okay, let's move on. So, one thing we must believe in is the transmission, uh, faithful transmission. How? These things write I, I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. When he says the house of God, is he talking about this literal building structure, or is it something else? Well, he, he refers to it further. It says, which is the church of the living God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground. Now, when it says pillar and ground, this has to do with supporting structures of the truth. These are the supporting structures of the truth. That's the church of which we now are a part. In other words, the supporting structures of the truth will be the church, which was specially created, not evolved, but specially created. That involves us. Therefore, we are going to be used by God in some way in the preservation of God's truth. In some way, it's got to happen. And through history, we should see this. We should see an unfolding work of preservation by the church. Now, after saying that, um, we've got to also admit something else. That the enemy was also at work. And to say that the enemy was not at work would be just a denial of these passages. Look at this. This comes from 2 Thessalonians 3.17. Look at this. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Well, you want, to, you want to know why he did that. I mean, here he is. He will quote to Tertius, and Tertius would write this stuff down. But then at the end, there is a salutation which Paul puts in there, right, with his own hand. And you can see this in other places mentioned, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Um, it's mentioned there. And then further, Colossians 4, 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you, amen. You see there were people trying to counterfeit Paul's epistles. It was happening. It was happening back then. And my friends, we've got to say, it's very likely to have gone on today and in close times to when we live. Here's another passage. Um, For we are not as many. This is from 2 Corinthians 2.17. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. We are not as many. That means there's more corrupting than the few who are preserving. Okay, that's interesting. The word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So you notice the emphasis here of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Lesson. Here is a lesson for us. There should be, and I use this word, godly. You should see godly men within the pillar and ground of the truth, which is the church, working to keep this text preserved. We should see that. We shouldn't see the devil himself preserving the text, right? That's not making any sense. Here is something that you should think about. Why not go through? Remember the teaching of Westcott and Hort, basically, uh, was that in 1881, there was this revision where a group of revisers got together 
Do you know there was a man? You can look this up for yourself, all right? Just to see whether I'm making this stuff up. A guy called Vance. He was on the revision committee. He was a Unitarian. What is a Unitarian? Well, someone who does not believe in the deity of Christ. And when there was people saying, you can't have this guy on the revised committee, Hort and others says, no way he's staying. That tells you something about not just the revision, but the revisers themselves, what's going on in their mind. They wanted this Unitarian to stay on the committee. Well, he's going to be very happy with what's going on with 1 Timothy 3.16 then, isn't he? He's not going to want to have the deity of Christ emphasized. So you shouldn't be surprised that there's going to be all kinds of problems going on with these revisions. Go through the revisers of the modern Bibles. Then you're going to have a very interesting journey. Ask yourself whether that's right before God, whether that is what God would do. Is that pious? Is that godly? Is it from God? And I'm going to suggest to you, even just being using common sense, you'll see that the modern Bibles don't come from God. They're coming from somewhere else. Okay. You see what I mean? We can, we can, we can start to make some pretty good assumptions about how God is going to preserve His Word. Okay, coming on. Let's look at Jeremiah. Let's open up our Bibles to Jeremiah 36. This is a... This is beautiful, man. This is beautiful. Jeremiah 36. Now, Jeremiah, what a guy. What a prophet, man. Sinking down in the mud, having all these tribulations. I mean, the guy was used of God and a true prophet. And Jeremiah 36, 1, it says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Okay. Uh-oh. The son of Josiah, you know how it goes. There's the father, and then the son is something quite less. Quite often that happens. King of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. Notice in capitals, the Lord, that's the covenant name, saying, take thee a roll of a book. A roll. Man. Just imagine we had to bring along the Bible as a roll. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be something. And write there in all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, all, and against Judah, and against all the nations. Man, there's a lot of against here. Very negative, man. Oh, you Christians, you're so negative. Yeah, well, truth can be negative sometimes. Truth can be negative. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Very select. If you don't come through him, you're in trouble. Negative. It's not inclusive of everybody. You've got to go through the one way. And it says, From the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day, verse 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return they're going to change their minds. Every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So the harsh words against these people are with a purpose to bring repentance and forgiveness. That's the God we serve. And he goes on. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord and the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. And so this proceeds. Now what happens is, a little bit later on, uh, there is this instance where these words get spoken to the king. They come into the ears of the king, which he's not too happy about. 
Um, and come down here, it says this um, in verse uh, 14. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, unto Baruch, saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Baruch read it in their ears. Now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and other, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. All right. So the king hears about this. Um, and reading on down further, um, verse 20, And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishima, the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elish Elishama, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of the princes which stood beside the king. Uh-oh. So now it comes to the king, the son of Josiah. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. It was cold. had a fire running there. And it came to pass that when Jehuda had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the pen knife. That's an interesting translation, isn't it? Pen knife. You see, you can do a, a real work with a pen acting as a knife. Now, this word pen knife, it actually means some sort of razor, right? Some sort of razor. He cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. It's gone. Not preserved. Had it. Finished. It was written, all the words of Jeremiah, put on the scroll. Jehudai with his pen knife burns it up. Gonzo, man. Had it. Yet they were not afraid. Look at this. Were they afraid of what they've done to the word of God? No. No nor rent their garments, neither the king, ah, oh, he's complicit, nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll. Okay, so there's a faithful witness. Don't touch the roll. It's the word of God. But he would not hear them. Okay, some people don't listen. But the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of Hamalek, and Sariah, the son of Az Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdeel, to take Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. Uh oh now you're starting to see the action of God coming in, right? And I want you to see the action of preservation, right? Because what you're going to see here is the action of ungodly people, acting to destroy God's word. And then on the other side, you're going to see godly people used of God and God directly preserving his word. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, verse 27, after the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote in the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that, that, that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. And, of course, you can read the rest of it. He did this. And so what happened was the roll was remade. It was preserved. God made sure that it was preserved. But, of course, during the time that this all happened, there's new revelation come. And look at verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, wherein Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Here's the revelation continuing. We get, first of all, we get this idea that God is going to preserve His book through His inspiration, using godly people and intervening, and furthermore, the revelation continues. That's what I believe. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Is God dead? 
You know, is God? God's not dead. What He's going to just watch people burning up His word? Is He? He's not going to preserve it. I don't believe it. I believe He preserves His word. I believe it. It's just a matter for us now as people who want to be godly of God to find His ways and to see in history how He has preserved His Word. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Now, I never got taught this. This was hid from me. There are many things that were hid from me as a Christian. I, I was told things that were incorrect about the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. Things were totally wrong. I, I never heard about this great purpose of God given to Paul the prison. That was gone. And from that came all these weird doctrines, man. All this stuff where people would come back from camp saying they could now speak in all kinds of languages. And it was all nonsense. Give me an example of it. Well, I just gave you one, right? Just nonsense. And I was honestly, and I have to be honest with you, I was getting ready to walk out the back door. You know, I really was. And in, a, in, in conclusion, I'd like to say this. We used to have Bible studies. And we'd have one verse each. And each person would have a different modern Bible. And I, well, I had a King James. And as we would go around, even amongst the people with their modern Bibles, there was just no sense. There was no connection of thought. And by the time they got around the circle, it was confusion, man. It was total confusion. How come? They've missed this. They've missed this idea that you should have come to the Scriptures with a godly understanding of His preservation and understand that there are more who would try and corrupt the Scriptures than those that would try and see the preservation of it. Right? It's true. Man, is this not important? This is another one of the big fundamentals that this church has come to see. Man, is it changing my life? Since I came to this fellowship and started preaching here, I've discovered God moving in my life in all sorts of ways. And all sorts of new things from the scriptures have become highlighted to me, personally. And, you know, I try to communicate it. <laughs> I try to. I do my best to. It's a rock and roll, man. I tell you, the stuff that we have been given from God it's amazing. It's amazing here. And we need to get it written down. i got to get this stuff written down. This is one of my lazy points. I, I'm a bit lazy at writing. I've got to get better with writing. Now, Seppi is the writer. And, you know, the amount of writing she does is just incredible. How many articles have you published now, honey? Too many to count. Probably like a hundred, you know. You know. Huge amount of uh, writing. And I've got to try and develop that with the things that the Lord has shown me. And this is another one of those big things. And we'll keep going, right? We're going to keep going. And we're going to see godly principles that are preserved in the Scriptures so that we can see how God has preserved through time His Word. Rock and roll, friends. Okay, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee today for this message of preservation. We thank Thee for the life we have in Christ. We pray for those who are unwell around the world, Lord. And we ask Your healing hand be upon them. And Lord, that You would preserve this nation as it gets back to the Constitution, Lord. And that we would see a life and liberty uh, return as we are seeing it attacked in many, many ways around the country. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.